Hello, my name is Father Paul Wickens, Catholic priest, ordained 1955 in uh, Sacred Heart Cathedral in Newark by the most reverend Bishop Thomas A. Boland, who was a, a great man, a saintly man. <coughs> he was succeeded in the Newark Diocese by Bishop Garrity, and then he was succeeded by uh, Bishop McCarrick. And um, in 1955, the church was thriving. I mean, uh, we could always do better, you know. Uh, I mean, every individual could say at any given time in his life, I could be a better person, a better father, a better priest, a better mother. Anybody can say that at any time. And the church, which is made up of human beings, they always need a retreat. They always need a day of recollection, you know. They always need confession and act of contritions and mea culpas. And, uh, but generally speaking, uh, the church was good. The church was doing great uh, converts, spread of schools and churches were proliferating. Now, th that was 1955, now, um, 40, 40 years later, schools are closing, churches are closing, <laughs> the seminaries are empty, <laughs> the convents are empty. What happened? What happened? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Liberalism happened, and they got their mitts into the Vatican Council, and not so much the Council, but in the interpretation of the Council. They, uh, liberals in the Catholic faith ought to take a walk, really. They did back in the time of the Martin Luther, and all. they walked, they left. But now they hang around and make believe they're Catholic, you know, like the Madonnas of this world. You know, Madonna the singer, or whatever she is, uh, she still calls herself Catholic, can you imagine? And uh, leave, will you? Go make up your own religion. Uh, don't stay in and, and pull everybody down with you, you know? Give scandal like that. But anyway, there were many souls in the church who did not give scandal. They give just the opposite. They gave tremendous good example. They did tremendous good in their life. They did so much good, heroic good, that uh, the church, after their death, the church canonized them. That means it made them officially saints, that they could have public veneration. See, let's say, suppose your father or mother, any of you listening out here, was a real good per your mother was a real good person, and she died. Well, you can pray to her privately if you want to, but you can't build a shrine, you can't uh, put a statue in church, you can't have novenas, you follow me? Because she's not canonized, the church did not officially put that stamp upon that. They only put this stamp upon that person after uh, a lot of investigation and things like that, you know. But I, I'd like to talk about a couple of saints who are related in some way, you might not think they are at first, one is St. Peter Claver, <clears throat> who died in 1654. And the other one is St. Patrick, uh, the great St. Patrick, who died in 400 and something, like maybe something like 480. He lived to be a ripe old age. Anyway, he, he died in the late 400s. And this particular person died in the middle 1600s. Well, let's see who St. Peter Claver was. There's a church in Montclair called St. Peter Claver. I was there not too long ago to a funeral. And he's considered the, the uh, patron of the missionary work done among black people in the United States. Let's see why. He was a Spanish Jesuit. He was Spanish. I think he was kind of dark, you know, some Spanish are dark, but that doesn't make any difference. You don't think God has any regard for the color of a person's skin or anything like that. And what does that matter? Black is beautiful, white is beautiful. Uh, I mean, all, all those things are beautiful in the eyes of God. So he was a Spanish Jesuit. Uh, the Jesuits had been formed maybe a hundred years earlier by St. Ignatius of Loyola, 
<clears throat> he called it the Company of Jesus. See, St. Ignatius had been in the army. He was in the Castilian army, military. And when he founded this religious order, he said this is the Company of Jesus, a company, you know, like battalion company. And they began to be called the Jesuits. <clears throat> he was assigned to South America, to Cartagena in South America, where he spent 40 years in this great slave market of the West Indies, uh, laboring for the salvation of African black people. He called himself the slave of the slaves. He was their apostle, father, physician, and friend. Yes, slavery did exist, there's no question about it, and still does exist. The only correction I'd like to make about this, slavery was uh, a terrible thing to be a slave, obviously. Uh, although sometimes slavery is better than another position, I'll tell you what I mean by that. Like, let's say, suppose uh, we were invaded by uh, Russian communists or Chinese communists, and they raided West Orange, where our chapel is. And they either killed you or took you a slave. I'd rather be taken slave <laughs> than killed. And uh, I'd rather have my mother taken as a slave or my sister than killed, you know, murdered. I'm not saying that slavery is good, but I just want you to, let's put it in perspective, okay? A lot of people had what they call total warfare in the old days where they didn't, they didn't fight wars with, with, uh, with uh, white gloves on, like total warfare. In many places, people would attack a village and kill everybody in it, or only take healthy people out to be slaves. Otherwise, they'd kill them all. Rape the women. Uh, that happened in, uh, many, it happened in Africa. One, one village would raid another village, or one tribe would raid and kill everybody, and then take some slaves. So slavery existed in Africa, it existed in, well, I'll tell you why I'm connecting with St. Patrick, it existed in Ireland. <laughs> slavery existed in Ireland. And St. Patrick was, as a young boy, uh, we don't know where he lived exactly. We know it was what, what would be called uh, the British Isles today. So he lived, either lived in Britain or Scotland. And the uh, Celts, who were uh, barbarians, the Celts they say, I guess, raided the coast of Britain. And they'd kill people and burn villages and rob. And they would took some people back as slaves. And they took back Patrick. So I'm glad they didn't kill him and I'm glad they took him a slave, all right, rather than kill him. Because St. Patrick lived there in Ireland as a slave. He had a master. He probably was one of many slaves on this particular farm. It was an agricultural world in those days. It was before before they built uh, factories and things like that. And uh, he escaped. St. Patrick escaped. He escaped slavery. And it must have been terrible to be deprived of your family and, and your rights and your civil rights and many human rights. And he escaped. But while he was there, he learned the language and the customs. And he learned the mind of the indigenous Irish there the Celts. And uh, I'm looking at this little book of saints. He escaped, he went back, and uh, since he was a Catholic, he felt he had a vocation and he went, became a priest. And uh, he went to Rome and he was ordained in Rome. And then of course uh, Rome, the Pope, uh, sent him to England uh, which was uh, civilized, you might say, and uh, didn't have slavery. But he begged the Pope, please send me to Ireland. He could be sending him to his death, really. Send him to Ireland. Let me send me back to those slave masters in Ireland, to them, that made me work and slave and took away my freedom. Let me see if I can convert them to Christianity. So uh, he went back. Uh, Patrick young priest, relatively young, went back and um, he converted by his example, 
by his prayers, by his preaching. Oh, his life was threatened. The Druids, the pagans, wanted to kill him. <clears throat> and uh, there were pagan kings in Ireland, pagan nobility, and, uh, and God let him perform miracles. God performed them through him. And then he would perform a miracle and one of the pagan kings would say, well, tell us about your God. He has given you great power. Tell us about your God. And this is interesting about St. Patrick. He was trying to teach these people and he did what our Lord did. He used parables. See, when our Lord was teaching, he used examples of the agricultural community in which they lived. Our Lord would call his church a sheepfold and one shepherd. Our Lord talked that way, you know. The church is like a field and in the field there's weeds and there's wheat and they grow up together. Till the harvest time they're cut down. Then they're separated and the wheat goes into my father's barn and the weeds go into the fire. Our Lord is talking about in the church there's good and bad. Until death so they die, harvest time. And at that time, the wheat, the good plants go into my father's barn, which is heaven, and the weeds go into eternal fire. You see, that's why our Lord talked. He, he made people understand. And well, St. Patrick did that too, following the example of our Savior. He was trying to teach him about God, the supreme being who made heaven and earth. And he told him that there's in God there's three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What do you mean? There's three gods? No, 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 no. It's one God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, they couldn't understand that. He says, wait a minute. He bent down. He picked up a shamrock. Three-leaf clover. He said, how many, how many plants do I have in my hand? They said, one. Okay. How many leaves on it? Three. Well, that's the way it is in God. It's one plant, one God. But there's three aspects of God. See, and that became the symbol of the Catholic Irish, you know, to this day, the shamrock, that it symbolizes uh, what St. Patrick was teaching, or how he taught, about the inner life of God. God, one God and three divine persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And we as Catholics, <coughs> we very often refer to that, like at the end of this instruction, I'll give you a blessing and I'll say in the, name of the, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. I'll say it in Latin too, Benedictio Dei Omnipotentus, may Almighty God bless you. May Almighty God, one God, bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Descend upon you and remain forever. We're calling down upon God to bless you, watch over you, give you grace, give you salvation. That's what you want most of all anyway. You want salvation. You want other things. You know, you want health. Uh, you want uh, peace. Uh, yeah, we want all those things. You want food on the table. You want clothes on your back. Um, if it's in the winter, you want to be warm. If it's in the summer, you want to be cool. Yes, you want things for your children. You want things for your loved ones. You know, yes, that's right. But we want most of all salvation because this world is, is not forever. This world is uh, so long. Eternity is endless. That's why it's often symbolized with a circle. No beginning, no end. No beginning, no end. We had a beginning, but God never did. So we jump into that circle that's already begun of eternity. It's it's uh, an absolute, uh, it's an absolute uh, infinite concept of eternity. But it's a truth, you know, and if there's a truth, cling to the truth, cling to the truth. Truth will make you free, free from all these other falsehoods, you know, if you cling to the truth. Anyway, back to St. Patrick. Yep, so... Uh, he converted uh, this pagan king and this pagan king, and of course they have followers, and, and they would, in turn, the king would say, listen, you're my subjects now, I want you to become Catholic. Now, Patrick never forced anybody, he never forced anyone to be baptized and to uh, follow the teachings of Christ. 
But if you can get some help from uh, someone who was in charge, most of the time these uh, subjects of the king were not uh, knowledgeable and, uh, or I shouldn't say well-read, they weren't literate, and, um, and they were pretty much dependent upon their sovereign, the king. And uh, they, because he, especially a benevolent king, they knew what was good for him, they'd say, well, you, sire, you know what's good for us? If you think we should be baptized and become Catholic, we will. And many of them did, and most of them did. And Ireland became, quote, a Catholic country. Today, it's having problems with liberalism. We all are, America, France, Ireland. Liberals getting into the theological departments and the liturgical departments, and yeah, that's right. Um, but I, I started talking about St. Peter Claver who was a uh, Spanish Jesuit, and he, w he went to the West Indies, uh, South America, West Indies, and that was a slave market. And what would happen is Spanish merchants would go over to Africa on the west coast of Africa. I think they call it the Gold Coast, don't they? I think they do, uh, in the old geography books. And they didn't penetrate. They didn't go in the, they didn't go in the interior the Africans, they were warring among themselves, a lot of tribes, and they would come out and bring out slaves to be sold to the Spanish and the English, Spanish and the English, um, and uh, in chains, and uh, they were pushed around, they had no rights. After all, we could have killed you, but we're letting you live and you can be a slave. Okay, I'll take it. But <laughs> Uh, what, is there another alternative that I could be free? Let me go back to my family. But they were uprooted from their villages, brought out to the coast, sold, and taken by uh, Spanish to South America, and by the English to the southern part of the United States. And um, they worked plantations and they, whatever work they did. And uh, so when they came aboard in these slave ships, they were awful. Of course, shipping in those days was bad if you were not if you were not, uh, you know, one of the um, big shots, I mean, traveling by ship was miserable. The food was miserable. Hygiene was miserable. Uh, how, you know, I've talked to these uh, fellows who were in World War II and World War I, and they would get shipped over to France or someplace in a ship. Oh, they said it was murder. Now, you can imagine a modern ship uh, that's uh, propeller-driven, and how crowded and it was, and how miserable can you can? And that's in say 1940s and 1920s. You can imagine what it was back in the 1600s. Oh, must have been awful. It must have been awful. They must have been like cattle or animals, you know, just thrown together, given a little bit to eat. Of course, they they wanted them to survive because they wanted to bring them back, and they were worth money. And then they would auction them off. Uh, I was down in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia on a bus trip and they have the slave block of the, you know, where they would put the person up and say, now what am I bid for this? Look at his muscles, he looks good and all that. So they used to actually auction off slaves, you know. And uh, it started in America, I know in Spain, the Spanish were doing this in South America before they did it in America. And I guess in America it started, uh, I guess around that time too. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry, it was, uh, let's see, 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 see. Uh, I guess about that time, sure, because at the time of the Revolutionary War, which was 1776, slavery already existed in, in the uh, you know, southern part of the United States, working plantations and all that. And, uh, but I would say that, uh, you know, just as a, uh, explanation about slavery, of course it was, it was awful, you know, and uh, many, many people experienced slavery, and it was awful. As a matter of fact, it still exists in Africa. It still exists among some Arabic countries. And the Arabs were the great slave traders. They went into uh, Africa, and boy, they'd attack a village, and it was, it was awful, and uh, we can't imagine how bad it was. I don't know whether it's good to constantly talk about it, though, because then it creates animosities and hatreds, you know? 
Like my mother was German, she had nothing to do with uh, that at all. And neither did my father, but nevertheless, some people hold that against my mother and father for slavery. We had nothing to do with it. They never lived in the South. They were never on a slave ship. They never went to Africa. They simply uh, moved to Newark, New Jersey and uh, raised nine children or had nine children. Eight of them survived, went to Mass, were kind to their neighbor. And if people came uh, to the, uh, uh, if people came to the, um, uh, in the neighborhood who are people who are darker than them, so they live next door, so what? I played basketball with people of all nationalities, uh, blacks, whites, Irish, Italian, it didn't matter. We just played, uh, it was a guy. He was a good player, he was not a good player. There really wasn't all this race hatred, you know? I mean, the Marxists uh, preach uh, what they call, uh, they call it uh, tension between class warfare. They want that. They want, they want labor to hate management and management to hate labor. They want blacks to hate whites and whites to hate blacks. And they want uh, rich and poor to hate each other. You know, they want that. They like that. They like, and uh, there's a time to say, well, okay, that was in the past, but uh, why keep bringing it up all the time, you know? And uh, so uh, mo most of us have nothing to apologize for because we had no part of it, you know? And uh, plus that was centuries ago, really. Anyway, as Peter Claver was a great Spanish, and he would, go on the, he would go on the slave ship. He'd go on board the slave ship and bring comfort to the slaves. He would feed and clothe them, took care of them in their diseases. He baptized 40,000 black slaves before he went to his reward in 1654. But that's wonderful what he did, St. Peter Claver. God bless him. See, this is, this is not like, let's say, uh, a limousine liberal of today. Like, let's say there's poor people, whatever they happen to be, black or white or whatever, in Appalachia or in uh, uh, the South Bronx or something like that, okay? And um, a limousine liberal today would go in with his limo, he'd get, he'd get federal funds, he'd get paid, he'd spend a couple hours, get a few photo ops and come back and live back up in the suburbs, you see? But the saints never did that. They went and lived and worked and suffered right with the people they were trying to help, you see. That was one of the beautiful things about it, you know. So, um, Peter would say, we must speak to the blacks with our hands by giving, by giving before we try to speak with them with our lips. So before he could try to convert them, he would show charity, uh, he would feed the hungry, uh, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, you see. So it must have been a, a very pitiable thing for uh, this Spanish Jesuit to see this because he was from a country that was fairly, um, fairly developed, you know. This was the country of uh, a lot of culture and building and so forth. And so he was, uh, okay, uh, we're coming to the end of our program and uh, so we're going to uh, wrap this up in a few minutes. I just want to remind you again that we are uh, coming to you from St. Anthony of Padua Chapel in uh, West Orange. And uh, we, uh, we have a traditional Latin Mass here on Sunday. We have three Masses, three Masses on Holy Days. We have a Mass on First Friday, First Saturday. And we have the traditional Catholic doctrine, especially a lot of devotion to the saints. I just talked to you about two of the saints, St. Peter Claver, a great saint, a Jesuit, and St. Patrick, a great saint, who was uh, considered the uh, patron saint of Ireland. And by the way, when he came back, as I mentioned before, he had been a slave taken by the Celts, or the Celts, they say, captured by them. Uh, he escaped, went back to main, mainland Europe, became a priest, uh, was designated by the Pope to come to Ireland upon his request, St. Patrick requested it, because he knew the culture, the language, and he also had a great love for people. See, you love people even if they're different from you, even if they offend you, you know. Uh, we, we're supposed to love everybody. We want everyone. What is love? What is charity, divine charity? 
I want everybody to save their souls. I want everybody to be with God for all eternity. That's what I want. See? So if we love uh, our fellow man, it doesn't mean we necessarily agree with them on everything. We have political differences in this country. We have cultural differences in this country. Uh, this is a, a mosaic, isn't it? Uh, the melting pot, America. There's different cultures, like the many colored garment, you know. And uh, I would say that uh, we don't necessarily feel comfortable with every culture. Of course not, you know. Different music, different food. Uh, but we love everybody because Christ said, love thy neighbor as thyself. So we love our neighbor, and that is, I, I love myself, I want to get to heaven. So if I love my neighbor as myself, I want my neighbor to get to heaven. That's what I wanted to do, you see. So let's see what it says here about the saints. I mentioned that in our chapel we have stained glass windows of many saints, um, many beautiful saints. We have uh, St. Teresa, a statue of and St. Anthony and a statue of our Blessed Mother, St. Joseph, and St. Francis of Assisi. And um, I just wanted to look here on um, Acts here. It mentions, uh, yes, it mentions the saints here. See, a saint means uh, holy. Sanctus means holy. So a holy person is a saint. So if a person is holy in this world and saves their soul and goes to heaven, then that person, those people are saints. As I mentioned early in the program, that some people are designated and isolated and, and sort of crowned and uh, designated as people for whom we can have public veneration. Let's see. Okay, here in the Acts of the Apostles, which is the, uh, the book of the New Testament that follows Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then you have Acts of the Apostles. This is uh, chapter 9. Now there was in Damascus a certain disciple named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and ask at the house of Judas for a man of Tarsus named Saul. Okay, so we'll continue that next time. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain forever. Amen. May God bless you and your family. Thank you.